Um, we'll start with some brief introductions, if that sounds like the right way to go. Uh, my name is Alden Kroll. I'm a designer here at Valve. Uh, I've been at Valve for 17 years now, spending most of that time working on Steam. So I've designed a lot of the features that you interact with as a player of games on Steam and uh, as a developer preparing your games for release on Steam. Um, so I'm happy to do these kinds of talks uh, to hear both what kind of questions you all have and also uh, help provide some insight and best practices that we've learned along the way from running Steam for so many years. Arv? Great. Yeah, my name is Arv Morthy. Um, I'm a data scientist and economist at Steam. And so I'm, I'm usually sifting through data to try to find ways that both players and partners like yourselves um, can make better use of the information we collect on Steam. Um, yeah, so I'm always, I love doing things like this because I get to hear directly from you what, uh, you know, what your thoughts are and how you how you respond to the things that are out there for us. So I'm looking forward to this. Yeah. I understand it's probably 6.30 there. Uh, we're connecting from Seattle, so it's 9.30 in the morning here. Uh, so thanks for bearing with us at the end of a Friday after undoubtedly a long day of sessions. Uh, we'll try to keep this lively and hopefully interesting and informative. I think we'll get the ball rolling with uh, both some kind of general best practices and tips that we've heard developers ask over time, uh, as long with, along with a couple of questions that were submitted to us ahead of time. Um, and then I believe there's also a microphone somewhere uh, there in the theater that you can come up and ask a question. Um, so hopefully we'll get some help uh, towards the end of this session, uh, taking some of those live questions if you have them. So I'm going to start with kind of a high level overview. Um, thinking about Steam, it really, we find that it's helpful to frame a lot of our answers and conversations with our philosophy of how we think of operating Steam. We put a lot of work into prioritizing and building long-term relationships with players. So a lot of the features that we build into Steam and a lot of the services that we offer both players and developers are geared around making happy customers. That is, that is ultimately what serves both us and both you as a game developer the best. So if we have customers that are coming back to Steam, buying new games, playing games all the time, hanging out with their friends, those are gonna serve the whole ecosystem the best. So at the same time, we are also really interested in building out features and services that help you and help support you as a game developer build and run your business in a sustainable way. A lot of times that also includes uh, sharing best practices and tips and things like this. So while in this session, we won't be able to cover everything, the Steamworks documentation is also a huge source of uh, information, not only technical uh, how-tos, but a lot of advice and suggestions and best practices and tips um, so if we don't get to a particular topic that you're really interested in, I encourage you to definitely check out the Steamworks documentation website and browse through there. It's also really important, uh, I think, to remind developers that Steam is a global platform, uh, and we operate it as a global platform. It is uh, run by a relatively small team, all located in Bellevue, Washington, just outside of Seattle, and we don't have local representatives in different countries around the world. There's no separate uh, Spain store from the rest of the world, for example. So when you ship your game on Steam, you're shipping to customers all over the world. So that's important for a number of reasons that we'll get into later, especially with localization. Um, but it's really important to think of Steam in that way, uh, because that's not the way that all other platforms necessarily work. And we also designed the platform to be very responsive both to customer interest and customer preferences. So when you sign into Steam as a player, you're gonna see a really different set of games because you interact with Steam much differently than I do. So you have different friends, you maybe follow different developers or different curators, you have purchased different games, you play more time in different games. Uh, those are all things that impact how the front page decides what games to recommend to you and what games to surface to you. We think that's really important because we want to build Steam and continue to support Steam as an ecosystem where any kind of gamer can find the kind of game that they're interested in playing, whether that's a huge AAA blockbuster first-person shooter or a smaller niche visual novel or a RPG or side-scrolling platformer game. Any of those kind of games can find success on Steam and be able to find 
the customers that are interested in playing those games. And we think it's really important that that the Steam ecosystem is allowed to be able to have that flexibility and be able to recommend and surface the right games to the right users. So what that means is the small group of us that's running Steam uh, here in Bellevue, Washington, we are not deciding which games get featured on uh, most places. There's, there's a few exceptions with our curated uh, promotional deals. But aside from that, the things that are showing up on the front page of Steam are there because there is demonstrated customer interest in those games. We don't sell ads. So the big banners that you see on the top of the Steam homepage sometimes when you sign in, nobody paid to put their game there. We put the game there because we know that there's a lot of customer interest in it. And that's demonstrated by customers buying the game and playing the game. So we use concrete customer data to inform those kinds of decisions. There's not some secret back alley handshake happening to make that happen. Um, I think that serves as a pretty good kind of foundational overview. Arv, would you have anything to add to that that I might have missed? Or do you want to jump right into uh, your topic that you're going to cover next? Yeah, that sounds good. Thanks, Alden. Um, I wanted to, so Alden mentioned uh, the global nature of Steam and how you're shipping all over the world when you do. So I, I thought one thing I could add um, just to speak about next is uh, language support. Right, you know, when you when you're thinking about uh, localizing to reach the most customers, um, you know, English is only about forty percent of players' primary language on Steam. Uh, so I wanted to, I'm going to try and share my screen <laughs> and see if you can see this. These I wanted to share with you the most common languages that players have set on Steam, uh, aside from English. Dramatic pause. Can you does that does that look good to you, Alden? If you give me a thumbs up, I'll trust that everyone else can see yeah, it too. Yeah, it looks good. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to share these languages uh, up front, so in case it's of interest to anyone in the audience, um, these are the languages that show up most after English on Steam. So these are good choices to think about when you're thinking of localizing languages and reaching a more global audience. Um, there, of course, you know you will also want to customize this for your own knowledge of your game and its audience and things things you know that we can't know uh, from this. But I thought this might be helpful as, as a starting point uh, for thinking about localization. Um, stop sharing now. <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah, and another thing that uh, is related to this that I thought I might mention at the same time is it can be helpful to check your wish lists by country in order to get a sense of what languages are best for you. So if you're about to release a game and you've been gathering wish lists on the store page that you put up in advance of your launch, uh, you can go, and this is a question we get separately uh, fairly often, you can go and uh, check the wish lists by country that you have um, in order to uh, in order to figure out at least you know where in the world your customers are, the people interested in your game. So I'm going to do that really quick. I'll just tell you where to get that. Um, the, the, that data lives in your sales data reporting pages. Uh, if you click on regions at the top of your page, you'll see uh, a list of information uh, listed by region and country. And uh, if you expand each region or country, you can see the wish list balance for a given period of time. And if you want to see the wish list balance over your whole history, you could change the time period at the top. Uh, to start uh, when you put up your coming soon page and end today. Uh, there's a way you can do that customized. Um, okay, I'll stop there and I'll pass it back to Alden. Well, the, the wish list is a good topic to sort of continue on there because we do get a lot of questions from game developers about how wish lists really benefit them, how many they need to find success on Steam. So I'll talk a little bit about how that works. Wish lists are really mostly important if they represent the number of legitimate interested customers that are going to be excited to hear about your game and be reminded of your game when you hit the release button. So what happens when you release your game or subsequently put it on a discount is Steam will automatically notify those customers either through the mobile app or through an email or both uh, and let them know that your game is now available or your game uh, is now running a discount. So if that number of people that have your game on your wish list are primed and excited and 
ready to receive that notification and go in and buy and play the game, then that is going to serve you the most well. Uh, so as you're working up towards release, it's important to think not necessarily about concrete numbers, because that's going to vary a lot depending on what success means for you as a game developer. If you're a solo game developer, obviously success is going to look a lot different than it would for a AAA studio that has invested tens of millions of dollars into the development of their game. So the concrete number is not so much important, um, though there's generally more is better because that uh, generally represents the number of customers that have heard about your game and are interested enough uh, to want to be notified in the future about it. So as you're engaged in activities leading up towards release and after release that help generally make more customers aware that your game exists, that it's coming, um, you can check those wish list numbers over time to get a sense of how many people are excited about your game and know that it's coming. And if you're getting close closer to release and you feel like that number doesn't feel like a big substantial number, then maybe that means that there's still some more time that you want to spend building awareness and building that audience before you get to release. Um, I think there's some other related questions here uh, that we've had uh, over time. And so we'll let's take a look into the here. Um, one thing that comes up a lot is early access. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about early access at a high level, and then we had a specific question about early access that Arv can kind of dive into some of the data, or at least share his perspective as a data analyst or economist on that. Early access is, at its core, it's a, a framework of messaging that helps customers understand that your game is a work in progress and that you're interested in developing that game alongside their feedback and with their feedback and input. So the important parts for you as a game developer as part of that process is open communication with the customers along the way. So letting them know roughly how often you intend to ship updates and maybe letting them know what you're working on now. You do want to be careful about not over-promising things too far in the future because as we all know with software development, things are unpredictable. And a thing that you may be really certain is a great feature now and that you're going to be building out over the next six months may actually turn out to be a terrible feature and you may scrap that. And so it's it's really important to be careful about how much you concretely promise to players so that you don't back yourself into a corner and, and are forced to try to ship something that turns out not to be part of your vision or part of the essence of what your game is. But it is important to be communicative with your players along the way. And, and Steam, we've built a lot of features to support that communication. So the events and announcements system at its core is built around you communicating with customers. You can not only post big update announcements when you're shipping updates, but you can also schedule events for the future to let people know when you're gonna be shipping your next update or when you're gonna be hosting some, uh, you know, maybe a live stream where they can ask you questions about the development if you wanna do that kind of thing. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities there uh, to be in communication with your with your fans throughout the process and, and set their expectations about what is, what is the next thing you're working on? How long is the game going to be in early access? Uh, what are some of the things that you hope to tackle during early access without backing yourself into a corner? Um, and of course, uh, we're not able to cover every little detail about early access in this talk, but there's a great set of, of documentation within Steamworks, again, um, if you're looking for details and, and even best practice. So moving on to the specific question that we had uh, from Antonio ahead of time, um, you know, is there a period after which, uh, according to our data, that it's best to release out of early access? Is there, is there any demonstrated time frame about that? Barb, have you looked at that data? Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, so yeah, so the question and the spirit of it is, you know, if you keep your game too long in early access, is there a certain period of time that we see over and over that like, you know, if you keep it after this period, you know, people are going to lose interest, wish lists are going to stop growing, and maybe they don't convert after you release them. Uh, so it's better to just release. So uh, what I wanted to say is we don't, we don't see any pattern like that. Uh, we don't have any blanket advice as to when to release a game from early access. It really does depend on a game situation. Uh, and I have looked to see, you know, is there a time when, you know, wish lists stop growing or convert more poorly? 
uh, because it's just been in early access too long. And I, I really don't see any patterns like that. I would say the most important consideration for taking a game out of early access is whether you think the game meets customer expectations of a finished product or not. Uh, so that's a pretty subjective call and it varies for each uh, game. Uh, but there isn't any, uh, the good news is there's no period after which you fall off of a cliff. Uh, so that's that's something maybe to take some relief in. Uh, and while we're on the subject, um, a related question uh, that we've gotten and that I've looked at uh, looking at the data is whether uh, there's an optimal time to put up your store page or not. You know, just the same questions apply. Like, do you have, if you put up your store page too early, you know, do you do you see, you know, a drop off in wish lists or maybe the early ones that got on convert poorly or maybe the ones that are later convert poorly because it's just been up too long and you're not getting a lot of interest. Um, and I don't see any drop offs like that either. Uh, what I have noticed is those games that put up their store pages earlier you know, just have more and more time uh, for people to notice it and for people to wish list it. And so those games tend to gather more wish lists that do convert reasonably. Um, so uh, the advice I tend to give is that it's good to put up a store page as early as possible, meaning, you know, once you have an idea of what your game exactly represents and you're able to put up something that's going to be faithful to the customer experience uh, when they finally, you know, when they finally see the game. Um, at that point, get up your store page as early as possible. You'll start gathering attention and wish lists, uh, and that the data say that that tends to be better uh, as early as possible. Back to that, you all. <laughs> that reminds me of of some related questions that developers have come up with in the past, which is, you know, how do I optimize my store page to present the best to customers? There's a couple of key things that we've seen, uh, both good and bad. Uh, done with store pages. And so I'm just, I'm going to enumerate a couple of the things that I think probably have the biggest difference. Um, though really, we've been unable to A-B test this exactly because we haven't, uh, we just haven't done in, done that kind of analysis. Um, but the thing that, that seems to matter a lot to customers when they land on a store page is, can I tell what this game is and how I'm going to be interacting with this game? So if your trailer is the first thing they encounter, and it's a long form cinematic trailer that starts with 30 seconds of your company logo and the game logo, you're probably going to lose a lot of customers in those first 30 seconds that are just frustrated and can't find out what they want to know about the game. So what we recommend there is probably the very first thing in your trailer is you should get immediately to gameplay and show customers what they're going to be doing in the game and what makes your game unique and special compared to other games that are in the similar genre or theme. I, I find it fascinating. I look at movie trailers on YouTube a lot, and I've noticed over the last couple of years this trend that, where there's often a three-second micro trailer for the trailer at the beginning. So if you just go on YouTube and you look for a trailer for an upcoming movie, you'll often find the very first thing you see is three seconds of action, boom, boom, boom. And then it steps back and does the logo, does the intro, and does sort of the, the story trailer. And I think if big blockbuster movie studios are following that format with how they're presenting movie trailers, I think there's definitely something to be learned there for how we present game trailers uh, on store pages. There's a similar piece of advice then, I think, for screenshots, which is it can be tempting to show beautiful pre-rendered areas of your environments, of your levels. But really what customers are most interested in is what am I going to be doing in this game? How do I interact with the world in this game? So showing it from the customer standpoint, from the customer perspective, and even leaving your HUD turned on so that customers can see what kind of game is this at a really quick glance. And is this a 4X top-down strategy game? Or is this a first-person shooter? Is this a third-person RPG game? Things like the HUD elements on your screen can give those give customers that clue really, really fast. And it's a great way for them to tell, is this my kind of game? Uh, am I going to be interested in looking further at this? So I think that's uh, that's all I'm going to go into for, for game store pages at the moment. Um, but I think I'll move on to one of the next questions that we've gotten a lot, which is about discounting games after launch. So there's a lot of related questions of how often should I discount? What are best practices for discount? Um, how do I, are there events and things that I should participate in as a game developer? 
So our common advice is generally uh, think about the lifespan of your game and how you want to be able to move customers from different points of price sensitivity into your game over time. So at launch, you probably want to start with a price that is appropriate to the quality and the quantity of your game. And generally, as it ages and over time, you want to start or continue stepping down discount levels that you are providing. So you know, maybe your first discount is 10 or 20% off. And then maybe after a number of months, you are running you know, your third or fourth discount and you're moving that to 30% off. And then eventually you're moving to 40, 50% off. That just allows people with different capacities to pay for games, different price sensitivities, uh, to be able to get into your game and access your game. One of the important things that you can look at in the Steam backend where we show wish listing, there is a section in there called cohorts. And that talks about and that shows people that have wish listed your game over a previous period of time, how many of them are converting. And so you can look at that and you can see. Um, for people that have wishlisted my game in the last month, how many of them are converting uh, over the period of time that I'm looking at? The important part of that that you can look at is the larger than three month bucket. And as you go over time, if that number is growing at a much higher rate than your other buckets, it probably indicates that you have a lot of people that are much more price sensitive than you assume they are, uh, and they're waiting for a deeper discount to get into the game or some other excuse to get into the game. This kind of gets into a larger a larger conversation about what are all the kinds of things that you can do to get customers excited and to care about your game and give them a reason to jump into it. So discounting is a really strong motivator for customers, but other special uh, events and opportunities are also great excuses for customers to get excited about it because there's other people talking about it. There's a movement, there's a moment around it. Whether that's an update, uh, a live stream, a special event you're running, a contest, or simply putting the game on discount. Yeah, I want to jump off of something you said, Alden, too. I think a cool way of testing whether you've got the right discount level is to take a look at those wish lists that Alden just mentioned uh, before you run a discount. So you have a sense of you know all the interest in your game that hasn't yet led to a purchase, right? And as Alden pointed out, a lot of those people might be wish listing the game because they're waiting for a discount. And when you run an actual discount, Take a look at how many of those folks clear using the tools Alden was talking about. So once you're done with your discount, you might get a sense of whether your discount was the right depth, right? Whether you were discounting the game enough by looking at how much of that wish list uh, count you've cleared, right? And if you you didn't seem to clear a bunch of your wish lists, that might be an indication that your game is ready for a deeper discount at this point. Um, yeah, just a little tip that I've noticed in the data. Yeah, so I touched briefly on other kinds of events and things that you can do to get customers excited about jumping into your game. One of those that I, I mentioned briefly in passing is live streaming. And we had some related questions about that uh, recently, but there's also, this comes up a lot of developers wondering, if I live stream my game, does that help my game show up in more places? Does that help with visibility of my game? Um, I think our will get to that particular question. I'm going to step back a minute and just talk about should I live stream? What is, what is that for? What is that good for? One of the things that we see that customers care a lot about live streaming is because it shows them exactly what it's like to play the game, what they're going to be doing in the game, how they interact with the game world. These are things that often are missing from the trailer or not as easily uh, exposed by the trailer. And so customers really appreciate the live stream as a really quick snapshot of what am I going to be doing in this game? What is the core loop? What am I, am I going to be running around looking down at my character, behind my character? Is it first person shooter, et cetera? The other great opportunity that customers appreciate about live streams is when it's actually live and the developers are there to interact with the audience, listen to their questions, respond to their questions, engage in a conversation with players. So those are some useful things to think about as you're considering live streaming. And then there are special events like NextFest that are built entirely, well, built partially around live streaming and have specific visibility uh, for that. And Arv, I think you're going to answer one of the one of the questions we got ahead of time from this audience about, uh, you know, is, should I live stream? What does that give my game more visibility? How does that work? 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So the question was, um, did dev diaries, broadcasts, meaning like live streaming, uh, or regular announcements help drive visibility? <clears throat> and the question was kind of nuanced. It was saying like, hey, you know, is this something that allows you to get more visibility on Steam and grow your community? Or does it only make sense if you have a community in place? So I wanted, so Alden mentioned at the beginning, but I think it's worth reiterating that it's really customer interest that drives um, featuring and the visibility that uh, that games get on Steam. Uh, so we don't we don't actually have anything designed to give visibility to games just because they happen to be live streaming at the moment. Uh, and the exception is Nextfest, uh, where there is some dedicated visibility at the top uh, for live streaming games if you're part of that festival. Um, so it really is, so all of those activities, dev diaries, broadcasts, regular announcements, they don't drive visibility directly, right? It's all about customer interests. But, you know, if you are uh, making marketing efforts that bring your customers to the store page on Steam, and you're also uh, active posting regular announcements uh, and putting content up that uh, your community can engage with, it really can help grow your community. Uh, by bringing people back more regularly, getting them to tell other people, and just uh, generally, you know, generally driving interest in your game and preserved retained interest in your game. Now, if that causes a boost in customer interest, that can affect your visibility. But it's not a direct relationship. Yeah. Did I miss anything there, Alden, that you wanted to mention? No. Well, I was I was going to talk about sort of a, a, an adjacent point that I I think this briefly touches on with the the phrasing of announcements, but as you're thinking about even other adjacent kinds of things that you can be doing in your game or with your game to engage your audience. So thinking about updates to content in your game or running events that might engage your audience, you know, such as contests or giveaways or uh, things like that, that can be great at both engaging your existing audience, which has the positive network effect of those people talking to their friends, their friends seeing them launching the game again and again on Steam because uh, you get those little notifications or you see in the friends list that you're, you know, Arv is in such and such game. Well, if I see that enough, I'm likely to check out that game uh, and, and see what it's all about if I see that Arv is playing it a lot. So even the act of engaging and rewarding your existing customer base has positive network effects and also demonstrates that your product is is growing and alive and that you as a developer are engaged in fixing bugs and listening to customer feedback. And those are all things that, that customers are, are quite well attuned to and really interested in seeing, uh, you know, if I, if I invest in this game and play it and get really into it and I encounter some bug, am I going to feel confident that the, that the developer is there and they're going to be able to, you know, create a ship a patch that bug sometime in the near future? So those those are important things to think about along the way as well. Yeah, great points. Thank you. Um, I think we are coming to the end of the the list of questions that we most commonly wanted to answer, and I think we have an opportunity now to open up the floor if people have questions that we have not covered uh, and would like us to answer whatever is on your mind. Um, I do believe there's a microphone somewhere out there, uh, though I'm not familiar with the exact details. So hopefully uh, Antonio or somebody can chime in and help us out there. Or we'll just sit here and smile for a while. I don't know. <laughs> um, we can also keep talking about other related topics. Um, I definitely want to make sure that we have a chance to take questions from the audience. Uh, I'm Hello. just not exact. Oh, hello. Hi, hello. Great. thank you so much for the <laughs> conference and for everything that you explained. I was wondering, once the game has been launched, how important are wish lists? And should it be like 50-50 with the number of downloads? Yeah, Arv, have, have you looked into kind of what typical conversion rates are and, and patterns over time? Yeah, I have. Um, so wish lists after launch are also important, and they don't they don't convert. Um, th their conversion rates are not very different uh, from the wish lists that are made prior to launch. What is true is if a wish list has been sitting for about a year, uh, at that point it tends to be uh, you know. So if an individual customer wish listed something a year ago, 
it becomes pretty unlikely uh, that that wish list will convert. But within the first year after that customer made the wish list, there's a reasonable chance it'll convert. And that applies to after launch, before launch, uh, all of those periods of time. Now, as far as there being some ratio of wish lists to sales, there isn't any magic number uh, for that kind of thing. You can imagine it depends on a lot of things. Like you could have a high wish list count um, because customers are waiting on some feature or some discount or something like that. And you know that that's a different kind of reason for having a large wish list count relative to sales from you know the, the count you'd get if your game is given everything that a customer could want already. You've already released all those major features, and uh, you know it's it's just a matter of how many people are discovering your game and how many people are waiting for discounts. You might have a relatively low number of wish lists relative to your current sales, uh, so there isn't a magic number there. Uh, and I've I actually have looked to see. If there's some golden ratio of wish list to sales or some way of predicting your sales from wish lists or anything like that, um, because that topic tends to be popular uh, on some of the some of the social networks I've seen. And there really isn't a magic number. Um, it varies so much per game. Um, the number of so it's it's hard to predict sales and it's hard to say that there's a right ratio there. Okay, I have another question regarding to the wish list and the upcoming popular games. So, uh, is it the same if our game has 10,000 wish lists from India or 10,000 wish lists from United States? Does it make any change or any impact depending on the region from our wish list come from? You got it, sir? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. <laughs> I, I haven't noticed any pattern where uh, some wish lists are more likely to convert from some regions versus other regions. Um, it's an interesting question. Um, it hasn't jumped out in any of the data I've looked at. And as far as the Steam code, the code treats all those wish lists the same, doesn't care what country they come from. Right. Yeah, I mean, a key, I think one thing that is important there is if you notice there's a country that is associated with a set of languages, um, it can be important to make sure that your game is localized to those languages, right? If you do see a bunch of customers in a specific country that have wish lists that aren't clearing, uh, that's a good question to ask yourself. Yeah. Okay, thanks. There's, there's a related topic to that, I suppose, which is, once you're released and your game is available, then there's a number of places where we do have regionalized top sellers lists. And uh, so for at least, I think it's like the top 25 or so regions where we feel like we have enough, enough sales data per region that it's not too noisy. Um, so if you're, if you're shopping Steam from Spain, you're gonna have a slightly different top sellers list than I'm gonna have shopping Steam here from the United States. Um, and that is because we, we do see that there are regional trends and tastes, and also uh, some of the game interests can be heavily driven by language availability in games too. So there's certainly games that are, say, available in Japanese language only, and those sell really well in J Japan, but might not sell at all or, or very lowly uh, in the United States. And so having a regional top sellers list lets us better amplify those kinds of games in the countries where they're doing really, really well. Yeah. And I also remembered something that I wanted to add on <laughs> that's related to that question, um, which is, um, you know, even if the Steam client doesn't support a specific language, like if you're a developer developing in Catalan or Gallego or something like that, um, you can still provide that language in your game and indicate it on the store page to customers. So that's a relatively new feature uh, where you can put, you can still advertise that to customers, even if we're not doing all the translation on the client. Um, yeah, that I mentioned. Okay. Hello, I'm Thomas Sokolowskis from No Breaks Games, Human Fall Flat. Uh, and I have uh, always uh, this question, uh, is there any data related to how many players review the game in terms of sales? Is it related to how many hours they spend or and anything, any like cross spill to other metrics? 
Um, yeah, yeah. I've looked at a few metrics um, related to reviews. Um, I, one thing I find interesting is that, uh, you know, reviews, if, you know, if there, are, if there are a lot of negative reviews on a game, uh, it can cause some partners to panic. And sometimes there's a good reason, right? There's something you need to look at. And especially looking at the feedback uh, can be important. Um, if you, however, it, it isn't it isn't necessarily related to sales quite as directly <laughs> as one might expect. Um, we, there are plenty of games that have uh, negative reviews that are selling like crazy, you know, crazy well <laughs> on Steam. So that's one thing I've, I've noticed is the correlation with sales. Uh, from reviews isn't necessarily something so strong. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if there are specific questions you had in mind, but um, that's the only thing that comes to mind that that seemed interesting and noteworthy. I think maybe part of what was being asked also is if there's a correlation with the the volume of reviews on games with huh. the amount of sales. And I think when we've looked at that in the past, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but there is quite a variability in how many reviews a game might get relative to how many sales it's had. And that might be a factor of, uh, I, I don't know, maybe a lot of different things of like the scope of the game, the price of the game, the size of the game. There's probably too many variables to try to control for there. I think there's some really, really rough uh, generalization of probably the more players you have, the more reviews you have. Um, but I don't think there's a direct one-to-one -one relationship there that we've noticed. Is that right, Arv? That isn't something I've specifically looked at. Um, that stands to reason just when I look anecdotally on Steam. Um, but yeah, no, I haven't noticed anything about the quantity of reviews and how that dictates the number of players or sales or anything like that. Yeah. The players are to review the game it's not about how many reviews are there, but uh, like in one game player plays the game and he is more likely to review than the other game. What are the differences between the games? How to make your game more reviewable, so to speak? Yeah, uh, I, I do. Hmm. Yeah, I don't, Thank you. I, don't, yes. I don't think we've studied that specifically, so I'm not sure that we have some great advice there. Uh, we, we definitely ask you not to ask customers to review your game from within the game. Um, but we have built a lot of things into Steam to remind players to come back and, and review the game. Um, so we feel like there's generally a pretty good coverage uh, that's prompted by those kinds of services within Steam. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what else you might consider as far as making your game itself more reviewable or less reviewable. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I, that's not a relationship I know anything about. I can't see the theater there, but I'm imagining a microphone being passed to somebody else that has a question. <laughs> Hello. Sorry about that. I was turning the microphone on. <laughs> uh, so, uh, does anyone have any questions? No? Wow, you, you explained yourselves very well. No one apparently have any questions. <laughs> or it's late on a Friday afternoon after a, a, whole, a whole day of sessions. That's right. I'm, I'm hoping half the audience isn't asleep by now. Uh, there is a question. No. Yeah. I was about to ask the first question because usually it takes one question to, you know, uncork the bottle. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, sorry. Um, you were mentioned before about how um, regional cultures or beliefs could affect the uh, selling of your game. I was wondering if a culture maybe too specific to a region would be bad in the sense that it might impact the sales in a negative way. I think that could certainly have an impact if if your game is built around an entire premise that uh, only a small subset or a certain country or region understands, um, then it may be hard for that story or that theme to be relevant or applicable or 
or, uh, or accessible to people outside of that country or region. Um, so I, I think at that point, it kind of depends on what, what your goals are for, for making the game and whether you're trying to have a broad audience reach or if you're trying to tell a story that is going to matter a lot to the, the people that, 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 that understand the history and origin of that story. Um, and yeah, so I, I think that certainly could have an impact. Um, we, we do see some, you know, thematic specific stories that, that do reach, you know, global success. And I think those game developers have found a nice way to, to take that story and translate it into a format and a form factor that works well and makes it and in, invites players to come in and learn about that experience and that story. Um, so I think how you execute that will have a pretty big impact on on how accessible and and broad that that story in that game is more questions here hi i would like to know if we're going to be having some placements where we can actively pitch for featuring or is everything going to be kept algorithmically oh uh yeah we are we are never going to accept money uh to to have specific placement on Steam. That is that is a very strong part of our philosophy. Uh, we think that paid advertising on our platform is just not the way that we want to run the platform and is not the way that we think serves customers in the best way. Uh, we don't wanna be featuring a game to customers just because somebody paid a lot of money to put it there. We would much rather show games to customers based on their demonstrated interest and broadly the level of interest in that game compared to other games. So yeah, we're, we have zero plans to support uh, paid uh, placements. Uh, I've got one question myself. Um, I'd like to ask you about using the store page as a hub for content marketing, posting the diaries, broadcasting, uh, announcement, that kind of thing to, you know, have, give the community something to do on the store page and generate traffic. Does that help to increase the visibility of your game? Um, I, I think Arv <laughs> talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, you know, for things like live streaming your game, Steam is not specifically designed around the, the concept of increasing a game's visibility just because they're live streaming. So it won't, it won't function in the same way as maybe streaming, dedicated streaming platforms in terms of generating more visibility just because you're live streaming. But if you are thinking about creating content that your customers and potential customers of your game might be interested in that are related to your game, then you know, posting that stuff as live streams or as pre-recorded videos in announcements on your store page, that can be a useful way to provide additional benefit for people that are fans, uh, more ways for them to engage with your game and your, your uh, intellectual property that you've established, your universe and, and characters. Um, I don't know that we have concrete data on about how much any of that uh, succeeds at driving additional visibility. We did talk a little bit about how just you know re-engaging your existing customer base can have those positive network effects of their because of the way that Steam works and as a social network where your your friends see what games you're playing, that can have a, a knock-on positive effect as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've looked a little bit into whether hosting broadcast content, for example, on your store page has an impact on um, how people engage with it, you know, not just views, but do people wish list or purchase your game more. And I found it's highly situational. Uh, there wasn't, I was actually a little surprised to notice that uh, games didn't always just get a bump uh, because they had a live stream up and they had something to engage with. Um, it was very much about whether you know, that that live stream actually seemed like an important thing or, it, you know, it, it helped players engage with the game. It was very, very situational to games. Uh, so when we ran randomized trials, A-B tests, uh, we didn't see a pattern across all games. So there's no blanket answer to the question. Yeah, the really hard part about testing that is understanding what is different about each of the live streams and trying to control for those variables because that they can be so different. And I'm sure that has some bearing on how customers receive those live streams and how well that might convert them. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, I think the, the type of live stream, the type of game, the audience, all of that matters so much uh, that there's no blanket answer. Yeah. Thanks a lot. 
Um, do we have more questions? There's one here. Hello, um, one question. So is there a best practice? Um, how many major updates on Steam are recommended? Or is there a number of major updates which lead to a bad number, so affecting sales? Yeah, it, I mean, this is another this is another factor where there's not a concrete rule that can be applied across the board because each game is so different from one another. And it's going to depend a lot on the kind of game you're making as to whether it even lends itself to major updates. You may make a single player narrative game, and when you're done with that, that's that's the game. You know, maybe there's some bug fixing for for people that have run into issues, but it might be hard to justify adding a whole lot of unique content to that because you've already told the story that you set out to tell. That may be really different than a game that is designed from the ground up to be a live service game that has seasonal activities and new maps and new things that are rolling out all the time. So it's really hard to study that and apply a blanket rule across the board about how many updates you should be doing. But I think the important thing to keep in mind is what what are regardless of what kind of game you're making what are the kinds of things that you can do to give customers an excuse to care about your game so what i mean by that is if you're imagining it from a customer standpoint maybe 6 months after your game has launched what is what is going to drive a customer to suddenly be interested in your game now that it's it's been out for a while maybe the buzz around launch has died down why would i as a customer feel compelled to pick up that game now uh, as a customer, why why wouldn't I just wait another few months to get the game, which might inevitably lead to never getting the game? So the idea is to what what kind of events or excitement can you create around your game at fairly regular intervals over time to give players an excuse to to engage with the game? So that might be a content update, but if your game doesn't lend itself to that, then what are other things you can do? Well, you can discount your game. You can run contests, you can post interesting news about a sequel to the game, or you know, there's a variety of different kinds of things. So what I would encourage you to do is look at the kind of game that you're making, go into Steam and search down. Um, you, can, you can explore the different tag hubs. So look at the tags that are applied to your game. What kind of game are you making? Are you making a strategy game, a simulation game? And go look at the other games, go look at the top selling games in those genres. And those tags and see what they're doing. What kind of announcements and events do they have on their store pages? What kind of updates are they shipping? You know, if nothing else, for inspiration, for ideas of what you might consider doing with your own game and your own audience. Um, and try some of those things out and see which ones are going to resonate with your audience and your customer base. More questions? Raise your hands. Over there. Last call. <laughs> okay, thank you guys for your time and for your talk. It's been super interesting and it's a pleasure and an honor for us to have you here even in a virtual manner. We hope to, uh, we hope that we can meet you personally at some point here in Bilbao. You are invited for next year, so we'll try again. Uh, in the meantime, please accept our applause for your talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>